Um, this is the global effort that was formed in 2012. Um, that is an international community partnership. As it says here, a global um, issue needs a global effort. And we often say that, that ocean acidification is a global effect, but it plays out regionally. Well, what we needed to do is understand how this was playing out on regional shorelines, but in a global context. And so this is the membership that you see now in 2021, nine years later, of the countries where we have scientists participating in Go On. A network of actually, it's up around 900 scientists now from 105 countries. There's our um, website. And if you're not a member of Go On, please join. Um, we really appreciate the, the participation because it really takes this global effort. Um, ocean acidification, uh, as you see on these two slides, there's two things that are really important. One is you see the um, ocean acidification, the pH in 1850, and the pH that's projected in, at the end of the century in, in 2100. And there's a big difference in that pH level. So that's one message, rapid change in the pH forecast across the whole global ocean. But you can also see that the view either in 1850 or especially in 2100 um, is not consistent. There are hot spots that are clear. There are places where the pH is, is going to um, decrease more rapidly for many oceanographic reasons. And so what was really important is to understand this and then to recognize that this regional um, impact needs a local effort. And so not only do we have scientists from around the world participating, but these people have coalesced into what we call regional hubs. Um, these are geographically located where people are working together more intensively. Um, these are regional hubs of Go On, so everyone is participating in Go On, but they are also participating at a higher intensity level um, within their own region. And you can see where they're distributed with those orbs. Um, there is one forming in the Southern Ocean. These are very much um, ground up efforts and we're incredibly thankful to the, the activities that are going on in these regions that can really get to the heart of what is going on in those regions and also how best to coordinate and collaborate within those regions. Okay, so these are the three goals that Go On was organized around in 2012. As you see, to improve our understanding of global OA conditions, where it's happening, how fast it's happening, what are the underlying mechanisms, why it's happening. But to go beyond that and to improve our understanding of ecosystem response to ocean acidification, uh, what are the observed biological responses specifically to OA? How fast are they happening? What places, what ecosystems are the most vulnerable or the most resilient to really understand what's going on at that ecosystem level? And then third, to create reliable future projections of OA and its impacts using the knowledge that we have from both the chemistry as well as the ecological um, responses and to put those into a forecasting mode that will allow us to have these projections. So get that knowledge and data um, exchanged, um, ensure that the models are re robust and reliable. And then those models can provide the spatial and temporal resolution needed to produce societally relevant forecasts and projections. So, what we needed with Go On is this level of organization, this level of um, cooperation, and the science that needs to drive change. All right, so with that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Steve Whittacombe to tell you now about ORS, which is the program that Go On established. Steve? Great, thank you very much, Jan. And um, good morning, everyone. So I'm going to leave my camera off because I'm having terrible internet connection this morning. Um, so hopefully I, 
I won't drop out too much. If I do, perhaps, Jan, you can let me know and maybe um, fill in the bits I miss. Um, so thank you. Yes, as Jen introduced um, Goan, uh, as a community, we came together at the uh, call of the United Nations Ocean Decade uh, to create uh, a 10 year program of action, a roadmap, if you like, for how we would like ocean acidification research to develop over the next 10 years to focus around seven key outcomes that we felt were uh, critical for the, uh, the change in um, the change needed in ocean acidification research to de deliver the outcomes required by not only the ocean acidification community, but society in general. Those outcomes uh, are uh, the need for high quality, high quantity, high resolution ocean data. The idea being that many of the world's oceans, particularly the coastal oceans, still don't contain the data over temporal and spatial scales which is truly needed to understand the issues of ocean acidification in highly dynamic, uh, dynamic regions. We need to ensure that the data and evidence we collect for mitigation and adaptation strategies is it's the right uh, data. And we identify the key priorities because there is a wealth of data which could be collected. However, we have limited amounts of time and it's essential we focus our efforts and into those areas which provide us the greatest, um, the greatest benefit. We want to see long-term ocean, uh, ocean observing systems that are co-designed uh, to be implemented between the scientists, funders, and end users to ensure that the data we do collect is of the highest quality and of the greatest need, and also is sustainable in the long run. We all know the problems associated with, with funding sustained observing systems. We want to understand the risks and severity of ocean acidification on the impacts of marine organisms and ecosystems so that we can understand the consequences of the chemical changes that we observe. We want to ensure that the projections we make of how ocean acidification conditions and their impacts into the future are likely to be most relevant and also freely available. We want a public which is more ocean acidification literate, uh, so not just climate change aware, but also focusing in on, on a greater understanding of the, those causes and consequences of ocean acidification in particular. And also that the countries and regions uh, will routinely include measures of ocean acidification in the respective national legislation. There's no point collecting huge amounts of knowledge and understanding around the issue of ocean acidification if it's not then used to uh, create change through uh, national legislation, national or international legislation. And you'll see on the right that we have identified a number of key outcome champions who will be looking to take forward each of these uh, outcomes over the next year following a theory of change approach to create an implementation plan for each of those outcomes. Next slide, please, Jan. Okay, thank you. So as I said, what's the next steps for ORS? Well, obviously we've identified these outcomes, the outcome and the outcome champions who will now be forming outcome working groups to actually start this, this body of work. Uh, initially through developing and publishing a theory of change approach, uh, which will help them create an implementation plan and a long-term strategy for the delivery of that outcome over the next decade. Those implementation actions um, will help, well, actually the actions identified from the theory of change will also hopefully make it, we can make a start in the next 12 months. So it's not just about coming up with plans. And a key element will also be to seek funding to support those actions. Next slide, please, Jan. As we know, ocean acidification is not a stressor that acts in isolation, but is also in um, it, operating within a multi-stressor uh, environment. And in order to deliver the outcomes of ORS successfully, it's essential that we partner up with other UN decade programs who, who are dealing with other stressors. Uh, and one particularly close partner to us is GOOD, which is Global Ocean uh, Oxygen, uh, or the Global Oxygen Ocean Decade. Uh, a, gr a group similar to ours, but this time concentrating on the issues associated with global deoxygenation. 
And as you'll see from four of their key outcomes, they share considerable overlap with the aims and objectives of, of ORS. So working together closely with other decadal programs will allow greater efficiencies in how we deliver our outcomes. And indeed, Veronique Garçon, who co-leads Good, is also a, an outcome champion for outcome, uh, ORS outcome three. Next slide, please, Jan. So initially, what does this look like uh, in, as, as we first set out? Well, we're already developing key activities with, uh, in partnership with, with Good. These include uh, the, uh, a, new, a joint summer school, which will be run uh, later in, well, in November in, 20, uh, in 2023, uh, bringing together expertise from oxygenation and, and uh, acidification to to increase capacity and provide training. We're looking to, we've, we've successfully developed a cruise program for uh, a research opportunity in the Arctic, whereby we'll be bringing together observers of ocean acidification and, uh, and um, deoxygenation together on a cruise. And as I pre previously mentioned, the co-champion for ORS Outcome 3, which is around co-designing of long-term observing platforms is shared with with uh, good. Next slide, please, Jan. So hopefully that gives you a, a an understanding of where ORS has come from, what it's looking to do, how it's looking to partner up. If ORS is something you think you want to be involved with, get engaged with, the first step to contacting us would be to go via the GOAN website, and there'll be an opportunity to just contact the Secretariat and we can discuss ways in which people can get involved and contribute to working groups, to activities, to ocean acidification, or also across uh, development partners with, with multi, across multi-stressor um, activities. So hopefully my internet held out for that presentation, at which case I'll hand you back to the chair. Thank you very much, Steve. This was uh, great. And also thanks to Jen for this um, paving the ground as well. What is OAS uh, where we, in the, we are act in the multi, uh, multiple ocean stressor world. And now more to the, a bit more into the science, but also explaining some of the um, yeah, theory behind uh, multiple ocean stresses. I'm very happy to be here with my co-host, uh, Sam Dupont. Uh, who will now present. Uh... Thank, thanks a lot, Kirsten, and thanks everybody for being here. It, it's nice to see some, some uh, familiar names, but there's a lot of new people here. So th thanks all for joining this, this event. So we thought with, with Kirsten that it would be interesting to go a little bit more in the generalities of, of why it's important to uh, to study multiple stressors and in the context of ocean acidification, of course, as 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 Steve just mentioned, it's, acidification is one of the many stressors that we need, we have to think about if we want to address this and find solutions. Um, so we're gonna go a little bit into the, the, the why it's important, what needs to be done and how we can do this. Uh, th thanks, uh, Katerina, for, for uh, passing the slides for me. So next, please. So first, we're gonna start by, by setting up the scene. And um, a lot of what I, I'm gonna talk about is in the, the document that, that Kirsten presented at the beginning. So I, I really uh, suggest that you guys have, have a look at this. It's a really great, simple document that really explain all the important concepts. Next. Uh, but, but next, please, Katarina. Thank you. Uh, so basically, if we step back a little bit, the, we, we, we know very well that we, we can't have a healthy planet without a healthy ocean. The ocean is providing us with a lot of different services, as you know, from, from uh, coastal protection, providing food, uh, regulating the climate and so on and so on. So that's really the reason why we, we are here today, the reason why we are, we are here thinking about multiple stressor. Next. And, and overall, the, the issue is that we are more and more on the planet. We are about 7.9 million, and, and, and the projections are suggesting that we should be about 10 billion by the end of the century and stabilizing there or going down. And of course, we want everybody to, to, to be happy, to have access to resources, jobs, and so on. And, and to do that, we need energy, and, and we also need resources. 
And we are putting, because of that, a lot of pressure on, on Earth and also on the ocean. Next. So the, the, this is this is basically one of the first figure in, in the in the document, and, and and Kirsten already kind of presented it. We have all these array of different stressors that are uh, happening differently in different places, and of course we are here because we care about ocean acidification, which is one of the central team of Goan and ORS. But we also have to remember that acidification is just one of the many stressors that are occurring and maybe not the most important in some places and maybe not the most important today. But that doesn't mean that we don't have to worry and, and, and get ready for it next. Because if, if we are clear today, one of the main pressure, of course, is overfishing. I think we've been fishing as long as humanity uh, exists probably. And, and the, the thing is that it's getting stronger and stronger and more and more efficient with time because of improved uh, methodology and efficiency. And, and no overfishing is really one of the main issues we have to deal with. Next, because, because many population of fish are overexploited and, and, uh, and close to collapse in some regions. But I wanted to show you this map. This map is basically uh, summarizing in a very simple way the pressure on, on different population of fish. And, and what you can see on this map is, is that the pressure is not equal in different places. And that's one of the first message that I, I want to convey with this presentation is that we have an array of different stressors, that's for sure. And, and the second point is that depending on where you are, you're gonna have different pressures and then different priorities. Next. And, and also time is important. So the pressures are not always the same at different times. So this is a really nice little figure showing um, the different pressures that humans have put on, 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 on the planet over time since 10 million years ago. And, and the more we are, the stronger are the pressure. And you can see that some of the pressure have been there for quite a while, like fishing or pollution is also kind of more recent. And, and the, the last one, the, 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 the one of the latest of this pressure is climate change and acidification. And, and, and it's emerging, it's still an emerging stressor. We already see the impacts all around the world and it's getting stronger and stronger. So if we want to quantify the different stressors, climate change or acidification might not be the stronger now, but it might very be one of the stronger driver and stressor in the near future. So we have to think about time. We have to be ready for the changes to come. Next. So among these emerging pressure, uh, one of the main cause is the large emission of carbon dioxide that, that, that we do by, by burning fossil fuel, deforestation, and so on. And it's to the point now that it has all these consequences for marine environment. Next. Uh, and you have here the list of the different CO2 symptoms. You have global warming, more and more catastrophic events, has ice melting, sea level rise, hypoxia, which is the, the change, the decrease in oxygen uh, in, in, in water that can lead to, to dead zones and so on. You have salinity changes, and then you have ocean acidification. Next, please. And acidification is, in a nutshell, is, is another consequence of the carbon dioxide, which is if you put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, a significant part of it is absorbed by the ocean, react with water and turn into carbonic acid, and then modify the whole carbonate chemistry of the water. And, and we start to realize now that these have a lot of consequences for marine species and, 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 and ecosystem, it, it's, it's, and it's gonna get worse. And we have different ways of, of, of studying this, of course. Um, uh, and one of the way of, of understanding what might happen in the future is look in the past. Next, please. And, 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 and the last time that something similar happened, like a massive global change related to change in, in, the, in the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere was at the end of the Permian, where you had this mass extinction and really simplification of ecosystem and an extinction to up to 92% of all marine species. And that was related to warming, acidification. So again, multiple stressors. Next, please. And today we, we, we know from projection that we're gonna have all these changes happening too. So we, it's gonna get warmer, it's gonna get more, more acidic. Uh, it's, so all these changes are gonna happen. And again, it's gonna happen differently in different places. So similar to the fishing that I mentioned before, we're gonna have changes that are different in different places and uh, the impact will happen at different times. So remember all this. So next we have like kind of the first take home messages one, that the ocean is facing many stressors. So it's not only the, your favorite one. It's like all these stressors are occurring at the same time. Next. The, the next point is that yeah, the combination of stressors will, will be different depending on where you are and when you are. 
So that's also very important to understand because that means that the solutions that you want to implement might be different in different places and at different time. Next. And finally, uh, yeah, that's what I mentioned just now is changing with time. So next. So overall, uh, that's what we want to achieve. So now we know we are in trouble. We know we have all these stressors happening at the same time and so on. Uh, but what we really want to do is reach this healthy, resilient, productive, diverse, and so on, uh, ecosystem, marine ecosystem. And, and today we are here because we're interested in, in the resilient and healthy ecosystem. So to, to achieve that, we, we need to implement solution as soon as possible to address not only acidification, but all these other stressors. Next, please. And initiatives like Goan and ours that have been presented by Steve and Jan have really that in the core of, 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 their, of, of their project is really to try to address this issue. So it's not just about collecting data, but really providing data that, that will lead to solution, that will lead to concrete actions. So the next question is really, what, what shall we do? And that's the next slide. And that's another figure from the from the document. Uh, and, and basically, you have these these different uh, these different steps in a way that you have to do at at the same time. So first, you, you need to catalog the different stressors. As I said, it's different in different places and it's going to be also different at different times. So first thing you really need to understand if you want to address those is really make a list, make a list of the different the different stressors that are at the different places. So that's the observing aspect of it then you need to understand what's going to be the link between those and the, the impact at the biological level. And then after that, you have to think about, okay, what can we do about it? How can we address those? What are the adaptation and mitigation solutions as strategies that we have so we can implement that through policy and so on? And that would eventually lead to a healthy and resilient ocean. So now we're going to go through these different steps a little bit, just, just to, to, to understand a little bit what, what needs to be done. So first step is really cataloging the different stressors. Next. And you have different categories of stressors. So we, we, we have, for example, habitat destruction uh, through physical or, or pollution. You have overexploitation of resources, which is today one of the main problems we are facing through overfishing. And it could be also increased movement of species because, because of shipping, because of change in currents and so on, and that can lead to invasion and diseases. And then you have global changes like acidification, climate change, and so on. And also there are, it's kind of important to understand these three different categories because they have different uh, meaning in terms of are they local or are they global? And, and that can lead to different, of course, adaptation and, and mitigation solutions. So what, what we do will depend a little bit on that. Is this, is this a local stressor or is it a global stressor? Another thing that we have to understand is that is it a change in something that is natural, like temperature, or is it something completely new, like a new toxicant arriving? Again, that can have consequences in how we address and think about these stressors. And then is it a biotic or an ab ab abiotic stressor? So is it like an introduction of a new species or is it introduction of a new pollutant, for example? Again, it's important when you catalog your stressor to think about those things. Think about what, what are they? Where are they? Are they local? Are they global? And so on. And also realizing that, that all these things are interacting in a very complex way. For example, uh, you can have uh, extreme events that are a consequence of global changes that would lead to the introduction of a new species and lead to a disease that would wipe away a population. That's something that, that is already happening. For example, you have new, 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 uh, new, new, new parasites that enter population of echinoderms and wipe them away within a few days. So all these things are already complex and interacting, but it's really something that you, you, you need to do. You need to catalog your different stressors, understand uh, how they will change in the future and so on. Next, please. So that's the first step. And that's really what, what Goan is doing for acidification and many other projects are doing. And it could be, uh, it, it could be monitoring of, 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 of a chemical change, temperature, and so on and so on. So we are in a situation now where we basically are have, have a sick ocean. Next, next slide. And, and when I say we need to catalog the stressor, is like we also have to reflect about what exactly do we need to measure? What, what level of, of monitoring or observing do we need to actually address the issue? Because when you're sick, you don't want to monitor anything. Next, please. You, first, you don't want to underdo it. If you're sick and you don't know what you have, just taking your temperature is not gonna be good enough. 
Next slide, please. But on the other hand, if you just have a call, you don't want to spend a lot of time and energy going into really deep medical measurements. So what you really want to do is target and have the right level of observation to identify the problem and find the solution. Next, please. So it's basically like if you're sick and you go to the doctor, the doctor is not going to take blood and measure everything. That's That would be ridiculous, costly, and, and, and unnecessary in many ways. So when it comes to cataloging the stressor, it's the same approach. We have a sick ocean, we have, we have a disease ongoing, and what we need to do is really to identify what are the main problems so we can address them and what are the main problems today and what are the main problems tomorrow. So in a way, it's really important that we need to prioritize. We are in trouble now. We need to act as soon as possible. And what is really important is to prioritize what needs to be done. And when you catalog your stressor, you have to identify your main problems. Next, please. And in some, in some places, you're gonna face that situation where you have multiple stressors that are equally important. You can have in a place where you have a lot of pollution and, and uh, for example, warming going really fast. So in that case, addressing only one of the problem is not going to be enough. You have to address these two problems at the same time. So that would be the situation that if, if you face together at the same time, the lion and a tiger are chasing you. If you just get rid of one of them, you're still dead because uh, the other one will get you. But in some cases, in some places, you might face another situation. Next, please. Something like this, where you basically are, two, you have two threads, one thread that is very important now and one other thread that is not a problem right now. So in that case, if you're chased by a baby tiger and an adult tiger, you better get rid of the big, the big one first and then worry about the second one. You can start by worrying already today, of course, and ensure that the, the, the small tiger is not going to go into, grow into a big one that's going to get you later. But it's important to realize the scale of it and the priorities, because if you don't, you're going to waste resources, waste time. So that's that's the next take home message, if, if you if you will. Next slide, please, which is you need to define your local priorities that will require observation and monitoring of stressor at the right scale. So you want to measure the right thing at the to, to speed up the process. We don't have the luxury of time anymore. We really need to identify what are the main issues right away. All right, next, please. So it's not only, and then it's the second part is that if you really want to understand what's gonna happen to your favorite ecosystem, your favorite resources, your favorite service that the ocean is providing to us, it's not only about monitoring. If you just measure temperature, pH, carbonate chemistry, pollution, at the end of the day, that doesn't resolve anything. And it, even worse, it doesn't necessarily tell you uh, what's going to happen because a change of two degrees of temperature in one place might be the, have the same effect as the change of temperature to another place because marine species and ecosystem adapt uh, locally to the conditions they are experiencing, and some of them will be more or less sensitive. So you have to, to think about the exposure, which is what I just talked about, like monitoring the different stressors and so on, and the effects. And the effects will really depend on the sensitivity of species and ecosystem. So that's again, will be different at every location. So it's extremely important that you consider both the observing side, but also the impact side, the effect size. And, and, to, and both a combination of these will link to the priority of stressor. And then after that, you can really think about, okay, what kind of solution can I locally implement to address the main drivers? So very important. Next, please. So the second step is really evaluating the effects. And that's following the, princes, the, the, princes, the principle of Paracelsus, thing like the dose make the poison. So first, the stronger your stressor, the more negative the impact should be. And again, that's on the half of the problem. There will be also the other side, which is um, the, the local adaptation. So the fact that organisms at different places respond differently. And to illustrate that, I will give you just one example. So next slide from studies that have been done on ocean acidification along the coast of Chile. So some colleague of us, uh, Christian Vargas and other colleagues, did an experiment where they collected the same species of copepods, so exactly the same species, in two different locations uh, along the coast of Chile. And they exposed them to the same conditions of, 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 of uh, low pH, so they decreased the pH to a certain level, or they increased the carbon dioxide, if you will. And what they showed 
was was a little bit striking is that in in one population of copepod uh, they were re responding responding really negatively to to that change in pH so they were producing much less eggs and so on while the other population they were actually doing perfectly fine they even had like a small positive effect of, of the change in pH so in one population you decrease the pH very negative effect on the other one positive effect. So that's kind of puzzling, same species to different populations. So that illustrates the fact that just understanding a change in, in the chemistry or a change in, in pollution level is sometimes not enough to predict the biological response. And that's really what we should care about eventually, because that's what's going to change the, the, the services that the ocean is providing to us. So how, how can we explain this? That's kind of the next question. How, why are these, for example, two populations of the same species responding differently to the same change in, in, in pH in this case. Next, and, and the reason is that it's something called local adaptation. So organisms tend to adapt to the conditions in which they live. So for example, a fish that, that lives in the, the polar region is adapted to cold and then won't be negatively impacted by cold temperature because that's where they live. Where if you take a, a, a fish uh, coming from the tropic and you put them in cold water, of course, they're gonna experience a lot of negative effects. So stress is something that is relative. It's not something you won't have one temperature that is negative for all the species in the world. You won't have one pH value that is wrong for all the species. You really have to understand what, what are the conditions at, uh, in which the organism are living today because that will define what they are adapted to and that will tell you something about what is good and what is bad for those guys. So that's also highlighting the importance of monitoring at the right scale. You have to go close to the species you're interested in or the ecosystem you want to study and understand what are the conditions they experience today. Next, please. So if you read about these, uh, you're going to see a lot of, 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 of words like stressor, driver, stress, and very often in the literature, it's used in the wrong way. So it's not because something is changing that it's a stress. And that's one thing you have to remember. Uh, for example, if you have a temperature increase of, of of 10 degrees and a temperature of 12 degrees that is warmer, it's not necessarily a stress if it's within the present range of variability. If you're used to it again, it's not a stress for you. So a stress is really something, it's a negative response that is uh, uh, just uh, driven by, by, by a change. For example, if you have a, an increase in temperature to a certain extent, that is going to create a stress. So it's something that is that is changing again is not necessarily a stress. And I will show you that with an example in the next slide. So this is, for example, an, uh, a study that has been done, next please, uh, an experiment that has been done on, on sea urchin larvae, but it doesn't really matter. What, what you can see on the x-axis is the pH, so the absolute pH value. And what you can see on the y-axis is the biological response. In that case, it's a change in growth rate. And the, the gray part that you can see on the slide here is the range variability of pH in the field where they live. And what you can see is that if you decrease the pH within the range of variability of today, they decrease a little bit their growth rate. So there is an effect, but it's not a stress. It's basically phenotypic plasticity. So they change their, their performance. So they grow a little bit slower, but that doesn't really kill them. They still settle and, and reproduce perfectly well. So in that case, pH within that range is not a stressor, it's a driver. So it's driving a biological response that is not a stress and is not very negative for the organism. But if you go out of this present range of natural variabilities on the left side of the graph, then you start to have a really something completely different. So they grow much, much slower. So we cross what we call the physiological tipping point and then they really start to get in trouble. So they have a really strong stress reaction. They start to be abnormal. They start dying and so on. So in that case, pH that was a driver turns into a stressor and start to have strong negative effect on the organism. So that's important when you, when you monitor or observe your different stressors or drivers out there to really understand, is it a stressor, is it a driver? Next slide, please. And really that's what explains the difference we saw between the two populations of copepods. So the one that was showing a very negative response lives in conditions that are very stable. So they never experience change. So a small change is a big stress for them. While the population two of copepot is living in a quite variable environment. And in that case, they are used to change. They are used to these values that they were exposed to. And in that case, that's not the stress. They actually actually do better. 
a little bit better in those conditions. So to keep in mind, a stressor is not, for example, you can't say that pH 7.6 is a stress for all the organisms on Earth. As, as a, a threshold will be relative. All right, and the uh, so next slide, please. And I'm gonna skip that one so you can go to the next one directly. Thank you. So in conclusion, uh, we are facing a lot of different stressors, right? And there, there's, the combinations are different in different places. And they're also changing with time, this priority list. And to define really the local priorities, you need first to observe out there what so monitor, observe the different stressors at the right scale. And then you need to understand the local biological sensitivities because in many cases, you won't have one magical threshold that will explain the biological response everywhere. There is not like a single increase in temperature or a single decrease in pH that will lead to negative effect everywhere. All right, so next please. So why is that all important is because we want to, uh, to implement solutions. So we just don't want to document the disaster. We really want to use this knowledge that we are gathering, this science that we are collecting for a purpose. So the science, again, we don't have the luxury of time. We have limited resources. We need to act as soon as possible. So we need uh, to identify priorities and, and these priorities should be based on science. And there, there is an array of different options and Jean-Pierre will, will present or talk about that in a minute. I think he's, he's the, the author of the paper where I extracted this, uh, this figure where you basically have a, a, a range of different actions that you, you can implement. Some of them are already ready. So you can protect what we have, you can repair what has been damaged society and, 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 and industry can adapt. And then you, can, you, you also have to work on mitigation, which is getting rid of the problem to start with. But then when you have your list of, 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 of stressors and you look at it in front of where I live, this is the list of the different stressors that I have. What can I do? What, can, what are the best options? And, and in some cases, these solutions will be ready and you can just work in, in implementation of those. And in some cases, the, the, the solutions are not there yet and will need to be tested or you will, we won't be able in some cases also to identify which are the main drivers. And that's really where the science priorities should be, should be considered. Like it's like, what is the science that we need for the ocean that we want, which was like the motto of the UN decade. So next, please. So you have these three steps, right? You have local monitoring of the different uh, drivers. You're gonna have understanding the biological sensitivity and, and really think about solution. And solution should be actually at the core, the, the first thing you have to think about when you, when you think about your future science. So next slide, please. So the, the, for the second part, are we gonna go a little bit deeper into the really the science that we need if we really want to address multiple stressors? Because the question, as, as Kirsten mentioned in her introduction, next please, is really that we have all these different drivers, A, B, C, and D, or stressors, and we really want to understand what's happening when you combine them. And that's a really challenging task. And that's, a, that's really the science where we, we have a lot of work to do if we really want to understand that. We have some kind of general rules. Next slide, please. So Shinedu is going to talk later about, about the resource available made this really cool paper where she, where she manipulated a lot of different drivers and stressors. And what she showed this general trend that the more, the more you have, the more negative the impact. And, and that's of course a local kind of a common sense rule. If you increase the pressure on an ecosystem, of course there will be negative effect. And the more, the more stressors you have, the more negative the impact. But in, in many cases, we have to go further than that. We have to really to understand uh, how much worse a stressor can be if you add another one, because that will influence the, the, strategy, the, the, the list of priorities that you have. So it could be that one stressor is not such a big deal, but if you combine it with another one, it becomes very important. Next slide, please. So that, that, that's where these concepts are entering into the game. So you will read again in the literature, a lot of terminologies like stressors are additive, synergistic uh, or antagonistic. And, and very often these concepts are poorly understood. And I will just illustrate what that means with a, a few examples. So if you go to the next slide, this is a theoretical example where let's say we want to study the impact of increased temperature on muscles and we have three different uh, conditions. So you have a control, then you increase the temperature by two degrees and the muscle grow by 10% faster. And then you increase by four degrees and they increase by 15%. 
So the question would be what's happening when you increase by 6%, which would be two plus four degrees. So think about it. Next slide, please. Do you think that the increase would be, if you increase by 10 and 25%, would that mean that when you combine both, that you basically increase by six degrees, that would increase by 35, less than 35, more than 35, or it depends. So think about it. So many people would say like, if the stressors are additive, then it should be 35, A plus B equals C, right? But in reality, the answer is, it's impossible to know. You can't just know by, by, by this data I just showed you. What you have to do is much more work. Next slide, please. Because the problem is that the perf what is called a performance curve, so basically the evolution of the performance of an organism uh, under different environmental conditions, for example, temperature in the example I just gave you, is never linear. You always have this complex curve. So for example, if you increase the temperature, you have an increase in performance, and at some point you have a tipping point and it's going down. Uh, so that, and that's true for most of the stressors that are out there. So in that case, how the combination of, of the two levels of temperature uh, will lead, we will lead to, to an impact is impossible to know because it depends on where you are to start with. Next slide, please. So we have, you can have the example where uh, you are on the, on the upper part of the curve. And in that case, if you uh, increase the temperature by uh, two degrees, you have a two degrees increase, basically, what, what I told you before, in that case, A plus B will equal C because you are in the linear phase. So in that case, in that case, you have additive drivers because temperature is additive to itself and additive effect. So you see that you have an additive effect, A plus B equals C. But then you could be on another side of the curve. Next slide, please. If you're a little bit higher on the curve, if you do exactly the same experiment increase by two and four and six degrees, you're gonna see something completely different. What you're gonna see is that the effect of A plus B is actually smaller than what you have if you combine the two, the two degree and the four degree. So it's still additive drivers, temperature is additive to itself, but you have antagonistic effect in that case. So what is called antagonistic, which means the effect is smaller than the, the addition of the two effects. And then you can have another case, next slide please, where you are higher on the curve. And in that case, if you increase by two degrees or increase by four degrees, you see an effect. And if you increase by six degrees, the effect is even bigger than what you would expect by just the addition of the two. So in that case, it's what people call synergistic. But basically the point I want to make with this example is that it's very difficult just looking at the effects to understand uh, if a stressor is additive or not, and actually understand the combination of effect. If you really want to understand that, you really need to understand the shape of the curve, and you need to understand where you are. So next slide, please. So in conclusion from that part is that even for stuff that are additive, so temperature is additive to itself, understanding how they will work in combination is really complicated. You need to do your homework. You need to study for your species, for your ecosystem, how the performance curve looks like and where you are. So how do we do this? And that's gonna be the last part of my, 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 my introduction here is how do we do this? Actually, you have to do a little bit more experiments than just complex multi-stressor experiments. So very often when people enter the field of multiple stressor as scientists, what they want to do is multiple stressor experiment where you combine, for example, temperature with, with a toxicant or temperature with pH and a toxicant, and that can turn into very complex experimental design. So it's really difficult to do. And the problem is that because of what I just explained you, that what you see the effects say, say very little about what's happening uh, at, at the, uh, if the threat, the result basically if it's interactive or, or additive and so on. So you, you can't really use the effect size to understand at the driver side. So to do that properly, what you need to do is understand what is called the mode of action. So you need to basically resolve how the stressor that you are considering is impacting the organism or the ecosystem you care about. Next slide, please. And I will give you like a, a silly example to, to illustrate that. For example, uh, if you have wine and beer and you drink that, you're gonna have an impact on, you, on yourself. So you're gonna get uh, you know, the effect of alcohol. So in that case, both of these stressors, beer and, and wine have the same mode of action, which is the level of ethanol increasing in your blood and then affecting your performance. So in that case, we can say they, have, they are additive. So they work together. But then if you want to combine with something else, let's say you take a medication, an antibiotic or something like that, and you combine with alcohol, in that case, you can expect to have interactions. Uh, 
So basically the point is that if you want to understand how beer and wine works together, it's just you need to measure the alcohol level. It's fairly simple and then realize where you reach your tipping point, where you start to have a negative effect on your behavior and your health. But if you want to understand how it works between alcohol and and, and the medicine, you really have to go deeper. You have to understand, okay, what is the medicine doing physiologically? What is the alcohol doing physiologically? So how, what kind of interaction can I expect? So you need to do what is called mechanistic studies, meaning that you really have to understand what, what your toxicant, what your stressor, what your, um, your, your change is doing at, at, at the physiological and ecological level. So that's, that's, that's something really important. Fortunately, we know a lot already. So there's a lot in the literature. Next slide, please. So in that case, you, you can actually refine it to be the definitions of the term I mentioned before. So uh, what is called an additive stressor is the absence of interaction between drivers. So it has nothing to do with what's happening at the effect size. It's really what's happening at the driver or stressor side. So in my example, uh, wine and beer would be additive when wine and a, toxic and, and, and a drug would be either synergistic or antagonistic. So these, these terms are when you have interactions between drivers and stressors. So that leads us to four different possibilities. Next slide, please. So you can have two different drivers that can have either the same or different mode of action or can have interaction or not. And just to illustrate a couple of those, next slide, please. Uh, you could have a case study where you want to understand in one place, you realize that global warming and overfishing are the two main stressors and you want to understand how they're gonna work in combination. And you realize by doing some studies that the increase in temperature kills 50% of all the fish in your area. And then because of overfishing, you also have 50% uh, of mortality of the fish because you just take them out. So in that case, you want to understand what's gonna happen if with the combination of these two stressors, warming and fishing. Next slide, please. So in our array of different combinations, we are in a case where we have no interaction because fishing, overfishing and global warming are acting on the fish population in completely different ways. And you also have different mode of act. So there are different mode of action, so they don't work in the same way and there is no interaction between these two. So in that case, if you want to calculate what's happening when you have A plus B, this is what you have to do. So next slide. So first, uh, overfishing is killing 50% of the fish. Next slide, please. So we remove 50% of the fish and then global warming is killing 50% of the, the rest of the fish basically. So next slide, please, like this. So basically you can calculate the effect of the combined effect A plus B by using a simple formula. You have the effect of the individual and you remove the interaction. So basically at the end of the day, you have 75% of the fish left. Next slide, please. But you can have other case studies where you can have stressors that have the same mode of action and that are not additive. And that's a little bit my, my example that I gave you with muscles, uh, where you, in that case, even if, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so basically it's the same situation that with the muscle example I gave you, you have two different increase of temperature, but that could be temperature and pH. And that can lead to complex interaction. And for that, you need to resolve the mode of action and so on. So next, please. And then we can have the worst case scenario where we have two different stressors that have different mode of action. So that's quite complex and they have interactions. Next slide, please. And that could be the case of, uh, for example, change of pH because of acidification and, uh, and a toxicant. And that we've made experiment like that, uh, that you uh, hear, and I'm not gonna go into detail, but we combine change in pH and change in, in pollution. And that, for example, we had a small effect of the pH, we had a small effect of the toxicant. And when we combine them together, we had a huge effect that led to actually to the mortality of, of all the organisms. So that was not something we were, we could predict just by, by looking at the individual effect of each stressor. So next, please. So that's gonna be a take home message again. So we, we uh, basically are facing a lot of different stressors. It's really important to prioritize uh, the, the, what we want to do based on the local priority. So what are the stressors we have out there? Uh, if we really want to do that right, we need to understand how the stressors are in are working together. And that's not an easy task. And if you really, really want to do that properly, you need a mechanistic understanding. Fortunately, uh, the, the community is getting organized really well. And the document that we just released now is, is a good starting point, but you have other resources. Next slide, please. And for example, there are 
really nice papers out there. And, and Shined will talk about resources that you can use in a minute. So we have, we, the committee is getting well organized. Uh, there are a lot of different approach you can use. Next slide, please. Uh, from lab-based experiment, field-based experiment, nat use natural uh, analogs out there, or use the field as, as a resource, comparing space for time and so on. So there are, none of these approach are better than the other. It's the combination of all of those that, that will lead to the solution, to the better understanding on, on everything. Next slide, please. So, but if you want to do multi, multiple stressor experiment, you want to do it right. And that's why uh, there are a lot of resources available now that you can, you can use to see, to see how you can do that right. And you, how you can define a nice strategy to really resolve these problems. Next slide, please. And that's also at the core of what uh, Goan and ORS are doing. So we have uh, two uh, a biology working group in Goan, and we have also in the outcome four of the of, of ORS, really like people reflecting on how we can do that right. And, uh, and the community is available for you if you need anything. Next slide, please. Um, so what we need, again, ju just to reinforce that, we don't, you, you really need a strategy. So you won't be able to resolve these complex issues by just one approach, one experiment. It's gonna require some work in the field. You have to do your monitoring. You have to, to really list your different stressors, identify your priorities. So that's gonna require monitoring. That's gonna require the understanding of mode of action and interactions and so on. Single stressor experiment, you're gonna need modeling, you're gonna need multiple stressors. So that's, that's really the combination of all these approach that will allow us as a community to resolve this. Next slide, please. So that's going to be my, my kind of last message. We need a strategy. We work to we need to work together to re and we have a strong focus on what needs to be done in, done in terms of solutions. Next slide, please. And I'm I'm going to finish by uh, mentioning uh, a future resource because we are planning a basic training course on multiple stressors. I think initially the dates were in May, but that might change. So. I don't take the dates too seriously, but we're going to organize a basic training on multiple stressors in Monaco in, in the next month. Uh, if you're interested uh, in that and you want to join, uh, keep an eye on the new stream of the Ocean Education uh, International Coordination Center. So then you, you have the link down here and I can put it in the chat in a minute. So that was just like a really quickly uh, a brief a crash course on, on acidification on, on multiple stressors and, and why it's important and what you have to think about. So thank you very much and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you and um, thank you also to Jen and Steve and we have now a few minutes to for some discussions. Um, and I hope some of the participants uh, will type some in the Q&A. So maybe Jen and Steve, if you want to put your cameras on. Um, in the meanwhile, I will just uh, go ahead and, and actually ask, where do you think as well the OAS program uh, contributing to this very concretely in the, um, to the world of multiple ocean services? Sam, you mentioned uh, the working group four. Can you maybe tell us some more your ideas about how it moves forward? Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, so, so, so basically, we we are just starting, as you know, and, and what we want to do is really try to provide tools for the community, really, like. Uh, for example, within Goan, we have the working group and we recently submitted a paper on, on, on the how to, what to think about if you really want to uh, start a biological monitoring program for to identify acidification effect. And it's, and it's really like a tool. It's, 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 it's a document that will help the community to, to, to think about the right things and, and identify uh, how you can do that optimally. And basically what we're gonna try to do in, in the ORS, uh, outcome four is something similar, is really identify key questions that, uh, that are key, key gaps in understanding or in best practices for the community and try to, to gather groups of experts that, uh, that can help to solve these issues and then provide resources to the community to, to basically do work as fast as possible. So take advantage of the mistakes that uh, all of us have done and not do them again and basically have the best, the best strategy and the best tools. 
And of course, we are welcoming support from everyone. I think this is a really open community. So you can join Goan, you can provide your sets and your interest to join ours too. And, and we are looking for a wide array of expertise and people, so the more the better in a way. So don't hesitate to contact us. Yes, and, and maybe out to, to Jan, I, I don't know if you want to react to this question. Therapy. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Kirsten. Um, I just really appreciate actually some of the words that Steve has put in, in the chat about ORS, and, and I want to amplify that. Um, you know, with, with, with Go On, we have the, these goals, you know, of understanding the chemistry, the biology, and, and being able to better project. With ORS, we're really trying to, to be transitional. What, what, do, what do we want to see at the end of the decade? What um, outcomes do we need to have? And it's very much um, going to take all of us to achieve those outcomes. So even though ORS has OA in its name, it is within the multi-stressor context. And so, <clears throat> So understanding how we're going to achieve these outcomes really takes um, people participating and thinking about how, you know, we all have individual programs and that sort of thing, but, but how can we put things together to really make some, some, some change? And so that's what um, ORS is, is striving to do. And, and that's a real ra rallying cry for all of us and, and it's excited exciting to me to think about how will we really put a high focus on this over the next 10 years. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you very much. And uh, we also have a question in the chat, which uh, from uh, Korea, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it correctly. Um, and I don't think it's naive, even though it's said it's naive, but uh, um, so I will just read it out. But when we try to model the multiple stresses, is it possible to account for potential feedback loops from the social system? For example, it includes in her study side that the kind of fish cat has been perceived qualitatively as a driver for further intensification of destructive fishing practices such as fish bombing. I think, I think it's not naive and it's actually a really great question. Uh, thank you, Garia, for this. So basically, I would say that that's exactly why you want to do this kind of modeling. You want to basically test what, what would happen if I do this, this or that. So it's, it's not just about projecting the future for the sake of it. What you want to do is project different futures based on different actions. So for me, that's that. I would say that's the ultimate goal. You, you you want to collect data, you want to model to be able to evaluate the outcome of of different actions, uh, and that's why you. I think that's why you want to model eventually. So it, it's like a, it's not a curiosity based exercise. That's really a, because we need to act and we want to know the consequences of what we do. So it's an excellent point, and I, I think that should be at the core of what we want to do. I remember. Uh, in, a, in a Goan meeting, somebody in the audience saying that what we don't want to do is is uh, is over is doing science that is that is not providing any any uh, anything interesting for society. So he, he said like it's, it's like if we were on the Titanic, and if you're on the Titanic and want to avoid the iceberg, don't spend all your time describing every cabin, every every detail on the boat. That's not that's not what the goal of the science is. Not to describe every detail, but having enough information to actually being able to to model these things and understand the consequences of our actions. Thank great question. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And if I may, I will just put two cents to that as well. I think that's also something where we at OAS um, here in the OA community are to really welcome more social scientists because there's really where we, in our analysis, miss some of the expertise to then go to the next step to integrate those, the human factor as well, um, which is still a, a big question mark and uh, in, in a lot of places. So I think that, really something where it would be great to collaborate and engage with um, other scientists. Also, of course, there it's important to engage with the indigenous and traditional communities um, who are quite often relying on, on, on those. And um, I think we will just directly jump now to also some of our collaborators and um, in the next 10 years, we hope. 
And I will start with uh, a presentation by Jean-Pierre Gattuso and Lina Hanton, who are presenting the uh, ocean acidification and other ocean changes uh, project, uh, solutions and action to address multiple stresses. And I hand over to you. Okay, can you, can you see my screen? Yes. Not, not yet. Yes. Yes, the so now exactly. Perfect. It's okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening. Um, thank you to the organizers to uh, uh, give this. Uh, opportunity to uh, describe a new uh, initiative uh, of uh, that is taking place in Monaco. And uh, I have put this presentation together with Lina Hanson from the Prince Albert of Monaco Foundation. Um, so it will be slightly different from the previous uh, slides, but uh, we want to highlight that, uh, you know, multiple drivers have also driven a change in uh, the initiatives that uh, are taking place around ocean acidification uh, in, uh, in our area as well. First of all, just to recall that uh, uh, Monaco is uh, leading the way on the ocean acidification. There are many actors uh, in this area um, have uh, started to work there in uh, quite early, uh, 1998, the first paper on reef building corals. Uh, 2008, uh, the second meeting of the ocean in this high CO2 world. 2009, uh, this uh, uh, Monaco declaration uh, provided by uh, and signed by Prince Albert II of Monaco. Uh, the launch of AMAO, the Monaco Association on Ocean Acidification in 2013. Uh, which had the objective of uh, promoting and facilitating research and capacity building on uh, ocean acidification. And secondly, to bring the message to high level uh, international forum. And then uh, we, uh, it became clear and, uh, and uh, it was important at the early stage to focus on ocean acidification because it was a new uh, variable that, that that, I mean, studies have really uh, begun relatively late. As, as I said, the first experimental uh, work uh, probably in the, in the 1990s. But it became clear uh, very quickly that uh, uh, we need to integrate ocean acidification as uh, uh, in within the all ocean changes and uh, look at the impacts and solutions to uh, multiple uh, drivers. And this fits very well uh, uh, with uh, what uh, ORS is uh, trying to do and uh, IOC UNESCO uh, through uh, this uh, report uh, that was shown to us this morning. Um, and uh, so we want to go from impacts uh, to solutions. And we don't use stressors as a keyword. We uh, follow uh, the IPCC uh, by uh, using the drivers because as uh, Sam indicated, some variables can be a driver in one place or with one organism and a stressor in another one. Um, so the main uh, climate related variables that are changing are illustrated here in this figure from the IP, uh, SROC, IPCC SROC uh, report. Uh, sea level rise, uh, uh, marine heat waves and uh, the increase in ocean heat content, uh, pH, uh, a decrease and uh, also uh, the oxygen loss. Um, uh, so we want to go uh, as part of OAS is uh, within uh, from impact, as I said, to solutions. And here are two examples of uh, uh, works uh, involving uh, solutions, the high level panel on sustainable ocean economy and um, um, a piece of work that uh, several of us have done and uh, which has been uh, included in the uh, SROC report. So the combination of uh, those two things, uh, the fact that we need to look at multiple drivers and also not only to document the impacts, but also to look at uh, solutions made uh, uh, us to change uh, 
the goals and uh, the name of uh, this initiative from AMAO, focused on ocean acidification to OASIS, uh, uh, ocean acidification and other changes, impacts and uh, solutions. So uh, what is OASIS? Uh, it is a, a loose uh, association uh, that combines uh, all institutions in Monaco uh, looking at uh, um, ocean change and, uh, and solutions. That's the Prince Albert uh, of Mon two of Monaco from, uh, Foundation, uh, the Monaco Scientific Center, the uh, Oceanographic Institute and the Museum, the International Atomic Energy Agency and uh, the uh, government of Monaco, plus a few other associated uh, uh, members. Uh, so what uh, the, the goal of was is, is to uh, organize uh, expert workshops um, uh, on specific topics. And uh, we had uh, several on ocean solutions. Uh, there is also um, a workshop series organized by the IAEA and on, on the economics of ocean acidification organized by the IAEA and uh, the Scientific Center of Monaco. Also the IAEA uh, International uh, Coordination Center of Ocean Acidification has lots of activities, uh, capacity building, best practices. And also uh, those uh, organizations and OASIS are contributing to uh, international symposia the, and the high CO2 one that is coming um, in Peru, Lima. And I strongly uh, recommend that uh, you join. It will be a hybrid format. And we communicate uh, in the past through a reference user group and also as part of uh, uh, UNFCCC uh, COPs. So several uh, papers pub uh, and uh, policy briefs published um, uh, as part of AMAO. So um, now we are going to uh, support initiatives. Uh, so for example, in 2022, there is a, one uh, expert workshop uh, on pathways to management of ocean uh, solutions, uh, which will take place uh, in two weeks time. A training workshop, uh, Sam uh, mentioned it, uh, on uh, multiple uh, stressors slash drivers. Uh, we are supporting financially the symposium on the oceans in the high CO2 world. And uh, in one or two months, uh, there will be a call uh, uh, for uh, submitting uh, research projects. And uh, the topic will probably be ocean alkalinity enrichment. In 2023, uh, there will be a second workshop on the management of ocean solutions, a training workshop uh, with, the, with the IAEA on uh, probably on blue carbon uh, and a call for research projects that is still uh, to be uh, determined. And in uh, 2024, uh, we have uh, plans, uh, but uh, nothing settled on synthesis activities and uh, training workshops. Um, so you should look at uh, uh, the opportunities that will be offered by OASIS uh, for uh, financially supporting both research, communication, and uh, synthesis uh, to uh, decision makers. That's it. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. This is great <laughs> showing those um, other activities are also going on and um, I think it's an exciting time ahead of us. And so without further ado, I'm uh, now uh, not heading over because I will actually play it, uh, but we have the OASIS uh, program now presenting and uh, because it's quite late or very early in, uh, in the US and, and I think, um, everybody who made it from there. Um, we received a video from our colleagues on the Ocean Air Sea Interaction Strategy. And I will share my screen. And um, this should hopefully work now. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for this invitation to talk to you today about observing air-sea interaction strategy, we're calling it OASIS, and how we might work together to amplify your ORS activities. Um, I'm Clarissa Anderson, and I'm at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where I'm a biological oceanographer, and I also am representing Southern California Coastal Ocean Observing System, where I am the director and today I'm representing OASIS, which is a much larger, larger group of people. It's led by Megan Cronin, Krista Marandino, and Seb Suarez. They're the co-chairs of the OASIS score working group that we had that kind of precedes the decade endorsement. Um, and we're taking a systems as a whole approach for making surface and boundary layer observations relevant to the Earth's energy, water, and climate carbon cycles, as you see here. And this includes physical, biological, and geological components. Um, we were recently endorsed as a UN Decade program. Um, that's why I'm here today to sort of discuss this potential collaboration with ORS and the broad goal of setting ocean acidification and multiple stressors in the marine ecosystem. We're really hoping that our UN Decade endorsement is going to give us the green light to harmonize these decade plans from Ocean Ops 19 and really try to make all of those reality. So first, to understand and predict the ocean's influence on weather and climate, we really need to accurately resolve air-sea heat fluxes. Um, the first step of developing this OASIS vision is determining what processes need to be observed. Uh, there's sampling requirements and certainty specification. The color coding in the plot here shows what accuracy the fluxes must be to achieve a 20% signal-to-noise ratio, which is our target. Right now, net sea, the, net, the net surface heat fluxes are measured at 22 surface mooring reference stations. They're shown here in the dark squares. And OASIS is envisioning a global network of drifting and mobile platforms that would be built around an expanded ocean sites network of reference stations in these 22 key regions. And in particular, these 368 light gray dots indicate 10 degree by 10 degree grid points. Um, this would give you 500 to 1,000 flux platforms, uh, where you'd have one to three platforms in each nominal 10 by 10 degree box. On the weather side, Luca Centrioni and collaborators also called for an integrated network with drifting mobile and board buoy platforms carrying a range of sensors, sophisticated sensors that would um, that would really help expand this the, and, and complement this vision. Um, a lot of these are described by Megan Cronin in her strategy paper, so I want to turn your attention to that for further detail. Um, there's, of course, this similar global network of Institute surface flux platforms that's been proposed as part of the, um, the SOCONET carbon community um, with that's proposing a surface ocean CO2 observing network. So this figure here shows all the sea surface PCO2 measurements made from ships and buoys since 1957. Of course, in six decades of observing, we still have areas where carbon dioxide measurements have never been collected. And if you were to look at any one year, you'd see many gaps in other regions of the globe. Um, so OASIS is hoping to provide a roadmap to fill these gaps. And as you are well aware, there's new tech coming out all the time. We've got wave gliders, sail drones. These show promise for extending the temporal and spatial coverage of surface ocean PCO2 measurements. And um, we're really hoping that, for instance, we could help make more out of EGC Argo. OASIS cuts across a spectrum of expertise and flux type. We've got physical fluxes to carbon fluxes from in situ satellite-based uh, air-sea fluxes, and then parameterizations and fully coupled data simulating systems that we're considering. And our team expands the globe. We've got a diverse team in terms of gender and career level. Um, the green here represents, or at least calls out, early career professionals who are helping us to expand that component of the network. And nearly all the members here were involved in some capacity in Ocean Ops 19, either as a lead author or a contributing author to a community white paper. This is our organizational chart. Uh, the SCORE Working Group 162 is working with community members across these five theme teams. Um, our core theme team will be the Observing Network Design and Model Development theme team. And that one is tasked with harmonizing the Ocean Ops 19 recommendations into the strategy. 
We've done a lot of work on this already. Um, this theme team will also define process studies and ocean shots that need that we need to reach our 2030 goals uh, for predicted ocean, healthy and productive ocean, and clean and safe ocean. So to do that, we need capacity, uh, we need people. And so the capacity and partnership building theme team will work with the other teams to develop curricula, uh, work with summer schools, mentoring programs around the world to build capacity and partnerships. And in this way, we hope make OASIS truly global. The Ocean Shots uh, and UN Decade theme team, that's one that I sort of sensibly lead, but we're all kind of working across all the, the, the theme teams. And here we're hoping to implement the OASIS Ocean Shots, um, really work through the UN decade and the national committees to ensure that we've got maximal coordination with all of these different programs like we're doing here today with ORS. And then the best practices and interoperability theme team is tasked with what can be very challenging, these best practices to get at um, how to best create experiments around air sea interaction variables that allow and facilitate the interoperability across platforms. And that's gonna be a lot of diverse platforms um, that are required and thinking about the measurement accuracy that is required to do that. And then finally, the findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, fair data models and OASIS products theme team is going to think about the OASIS products we wanna develop, including uh, an air sea flux toolbox, a library of direct covariance flux measurements, and, um, and hopefully improve gridded flux products that and make air sea interaction information open and fair. <clears throat> so I'm just going to finish here and say that given the growing emphasis on investigating the complex multiple stressor interactions in the environment, more and more we really need these sophisticated observing networks to accomplish our goals. Um, so I think here we're hoping that OASIS is going to find collaborators um, that are working to think about other components of the ecosystem that we may not be able to get to on our own, think about those partnerships, so that together we can really track these CO2 emissions and understand these impacts, um, how they influence weather and climate, um, and ultimately the ocean environment, ecosystem, and biosphere. So, Thank you, Clarissa, uh, even though not here with us, uh, showing a little bit more the, the background really of uh, the observations required uh, most probably to um, investigate the multiple ocean stresses. Um, and without <clears throat> further ado, I will hand over to the, and I'm kind of lost, um, to the last speaker, um, who will give some practical advice on uh, where we can access more information about uh, multiple ocean stresses. Uh, and I'm very happy that uh, Sinead is with us here today and can present about the resources on multiple ocean stresses. Um, I should just see if my share screen works. That would be exciting. Uh -huh. Can you see my screen? Yes, now you just have to make it exactly and then it's perfect. Okay, perfect. Hi, um, thank you so much for inviting me. And we've heard a lot about um, multiple stressor studies today. So I thought I would um, just present some resources for actually doing experiments with multiple stressors. As we all know, um, when you want to do a multiple stressor experiment, the first thing you realize is that there are a lot of stressors and planning the experiments can be intense and quickly get out of control, leading you leading to um, large and almost undoable experiments sometimes. And ultimately what we want to do is understand and predict the effects of multiple stressors on organisms, populations and ecosystems. And as Sam was saying, we often need to understand the underlying um, mechanics of what's going on. So we want to design experiments that are maximally informative in that they need to actually be able to answer the questions we're asking and they need to be usable by others. So this is what Jean-Pierre was talking about. We need to be providing information that's useful in solving a very, very urgent problem. But these experiments also need to be doable and they need to make best use of time and other resources. 
So we have to prioritize. Ultimately, ultimately, what this means is we need to have extremely effective experimental designs. So I co-chaired the SCORE project, Changing Oceans and Biological Systems with Philip Boyd from the University of Tasmania. And one of the main things that this SCORE project does is produce um, materials for um, making better multiple stressor experiments. Now, of course, we, there are lots of ways that you can find resources to do multiple stressor experiments without the ones we produce. There is absolutely no lack of published reviews telling us how to design better experiments. And most of these reviews are excellent. So in fact, the resources are out there. They're just not always as interactive as we would like. There are lots of best practices guides, including the one that we've produced recently. And finally, you can always take yourself to a workshop where individuals will guide you through exercises to learn how to design better multiple stressor experiments. And those can be in person, such as the ones that we run for different graduate school programs, or they can be online through, for example, the ocean literacy training courses. But today I'm going to talk about a very particular online resource called Metal. And this was a resource produced by um, Cobbs back when we were a working group. And Metal is an online resource. It's completely free and it's as interactive as we could make it while still keeping it quite general. And I'm just going to walk you through the various things that Metal has in it. And this is where you can find Metal. And this is our robot that um, presents all of Metal. So, Metal is a platform that contains a few different things. It has learning materials, which has um, introductory texts, terminology and definitions, and links to resources and references. It also has a decision support tool. So the decision support tool, I think, is one of the most useful parts of Metal. And this is downloadable or interactive documents that walk you through all the different steps in designing um, a multiple stressor experiment. So this goes through things like making a driver inventory, um, defining how you want your experiments to look, and finalizing your experimental design. It's iterative and it does take quite a long time. Um, the, step, the first step in the iterative design is just defining your research question. This requires you to go through things like explaining the pre-existing knowledge, making a draft of the driver in inventory, and identifying prerequisite knowledge. This is actually the kind of thing you would probably do in a graduate course on um, with an introduction to multiple stressors. In step two, you take this basic research question you've designed, and then you identify the responses, drivers, and the basic design that you want to use. And this step two basically gets down to what do you want to measure and how will you measure it very specifically. It also starts um, getting you to take some basic statistics into account. In step three, we finalize the experimental design. And in this case, we get into real detail about drivers, replicates, and statistics. The key thing in step three is you want to design an experiment that you're actually able to analyze and interpret. And so we start looking at things like how, how noisy or variable we expect our data to be, how dynamic our environments are, and what other drivers may co-vary. Um, Metal also has a simulator. This lets us visualize data from different um, virtual experiments, and it's aimed at linking experimental design and analysis. Now, one important thing to point out about the metal, metal simulator, and this is what it looks like when you're actually in the simulator, is this is not real data. So something metal is not going to do for you, it is not going to let you make a fast and cheap meta-analysis. But what it does do is it lets you visualize how an experimental design that you've come up with actually samples an interaction surface. So this interaction surface would be the real interaction surface, as it were. And these dots are the data points you would get from your experimental design. And so you can export all of this data and you can see how well you're actually able to understand this interaction surface between two drivers at different levels based on the experiment you've designed. So to do this, you go into the metal simulator and you actually choose the number and values of drivers levels. These are fake drivers or imaginary drivers. So you have drivers one, two, and three. You can select as many levels as you want. So in this case, we've done three levels of driver one, three levels of driver two, and we've held driver three constant. You say how many replicates you're going to do. So you're deciding how big you want your experiment to be. And then you say how variable you expect your data to be. 
you can view only the data points or you can view the data points and the model servers and you can export this dummy data set to practice doing statistical analyses on it. This is especially useful if you're getting if you're new to um, analyzing these types of experiments and you want to see if you can actually analyze your data. Um, just as an offset, sort of a little offside, the most frequent way I get into collaborations is by people contacting me to say I've done this experiment and now I can't analyze it. Please don't do that. Um, finally, Metal has a video gallery. It's also available on YouTube. And these are videos made by experts. They're short videos on very specific topics, such as developing a driver inventory, um, collapsing experimental designs, ecology and evolution, um, experimental evolution, data analysis. So what this really gives you is a very high level mini course on designing better um, multiple driver experiments. Finally, we have developed teaching resources. These are plug and play ready to go lecture slides for teachers. Um, basically, that will allow you to once you understand, assuming that you already understand the basics of experimental design, have something between a one day and a two day workshop on it. It has speaking notes, we have presentation suggestions, and we have a very simplified decision support tool that's useful for working in groups during a workshop. So I thought I would leave lots of time for questions because people tend to be um, interested in metal but unclear on what it does or how to use it. So. I'll end there. This is the SCORE project. These are all the people who help us. If you're interested in the, sort of these type of experiments, there's a conference happening this summer where we tend to talk a lot about multiple driver experiments. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to attempt to stop sharing my screen. <clears throat> Perfect, maybe. Um, we now have a few moments to discuss and I also invite the the panel to discuss and ask questions maybe to, to the other panelists. And uh, before we have um, any questions again in the question answer box, maybe it's a little bit early. Uh, just also from my side, I think it's, it's great to see all those different uh, activities around uh, multiple ocean surface happening um, and already happening for quite some time to Sinead, what are the next steps uh, for you and uh, with the score and our task group, I think it is? Or what's that? Um, we are designing slowly a metal 2.0, but I think we're mostly at this point, the, the most useful part of metal has actually been developing the workshops and the teaching tools. And so we're moving towards really improving those plug and play teaching and workshop tools. Um, because we want to move away from myself, Christina, Paul, and sometimes Sam, I think, doing, doing all of the workshops ourselves. We want other experts, other people who are familiar with these problems to have the resources to the workshops really, really easily. So we're moving towards that. Yeah, I think that's a great point because still it's <clears throat> quite often that, <clears throat> sorry, the, in the first instance, uh, creating the local capacity to address those multiple ocean stresses and that, that capacity stays. I think um, that's more general point for ocean acidification well, as well for multiple ocean stresses to um, uh, yeah, teach the teachers, hopefully, and that, that then will be also transferred to, to others. Um, <clears throat> also to um, Jean-Pierre and uh, Lina, those, um, where do you see, for example, Oasis as well collaborating with OAS in, in concrete steps? Maybe you can highlight a few points where you think uh, in the next one, two years, those two projects, programs could collaborate together. Lina, do you want to have a go? Sorry. Hello, everyone. Um, I think that it's it's a really exciting time for for, for us because this transformation uh, of of ammo into ACES actually um, 
uh, fits comes at a moment of or, or ours as well. So I, I think we're really excited in general to learn how we could uh, best contribute and collaborate with uh, within this framework with uh, with all of you. Uh, we are just starting this new model. So we're not exactly, as Jean-Pierre mentioned, some concrete activities that we're starting with. We're hoping that this will amplify and we very much continue, I would say, um, along the lines of the OEACC as well, to be there to support the international community. So we definitely don't want to act in a small silo in, in Monaco, of course. This is really to, to also to support uh, as we can uh, the international community. So concretely maybe participating in co-organizing uh, some activities. I'm not also learning how, how, um, how our wars is, is working right now, but I feel like we have a lot to, to build on through our uh, previous collaborations and also through the OACC, which is a key partner of, uh, of OASIS, of course. Uh, so looking forward to learn how we, we could best uh, collaborate and, um, and make some progress together, of course. Jean-Pierre, maybe you want to add something to that? No, and the, the workshop that uh, Sam, uh, has, uh, or the training course, I should say, that Sam mentioned, uh, which was due to take place in May and uh, maybe postponed, uh, is one example of uh, how OASIS uh, can contribute because uh, OASIS and the Prince Albert uh, of Monaco Foundation provide the financial support, uh, the IAEA as well, uh, and also the IAEA provides uh, the premises. So this is an example where there can be a conjunction of uh, support coming from different places and uh, to organize activities. And that is the very first one for us, uh, the, the training course. Maybe I hand over to my co-host. Thanks, Kirsten. Uh, so, so one of the reasons why we organized this was was to to, to talk about the concepts and uh, and, and have a, an overview of some of the key initiatives that are out there. But we also wanted to learn a little bit from you, uh, so the participants. So we hope to have people from a wide range of different disciplines, and not only scientists, but also people involved in policy and so on, social scientists for sure. Uh, so to take advantage of the time we have now, maybe to tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what, what challenges you are facing and what needs you have. As you can see, uh, most of the initiatives that, uh, that we presented today are, are relatively new. So there's, that means there is a lot of space to join and contribute. And, 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 and what we really want to do is something useful. Um, so please also, if you have any question for any of the participants, um, uh, the presenters today, the panel, don't, don't hesitate to do that, but you don't necessarily have to ask a question. You can also just tell us about your needs and, uh, and who you are and, and, and maybe a little bit why you're here. I think that's, well, that would be interesting for us. We can compile that later. And if you want to be contacted later, uh, that's also maybe, maybe, uh, maybe an option. So I don't know if there are some, I didn't check out the chat and I can see that uh, Kirsten is posting a lot of interesting links. So you're gonna have the link to, to ORS, like uh, where you have a little bit of an overview as well as the contact form that, uh, that uh, Steve presented earlier. And, and, uh, and, and maybe also if you could add the new stream of the OAICC over there. So the OAICC is another uh, of, uh, of this existing ocean acidification structure that aims also at uh, promoting capacity, science, and so on. And, uh, and there are many interesting tools that are available there, uh, including database of uh, the literature that uh, all the literature, as the acidification literature is reported there. And you also have data that were extracted from, from those. So uh, a lot of, I think it's, it's a really exciting time because uh, we, we are really at the crossroad now where we, the science is strong. We you had the IPCC report uh, submitted recently, the, the working group too, with basically state, uh, stating really clearly that there is no need to talk about more about this. This is happening, and I know it's really about implementing solutions. So, 
if you don't have any comments or questions, let me check the chat again. Uh, no, it's fine. Yeah. Jean-Pierre, Jean can you say a little bit, a, a few extra words about this, this, uh, these calls that you said, like uh, the, the, the idea of uh, increasing alkalinity, for example, uh, it, it's, it, is there already a, a existing big project working on those? Because I think it's kind of interesting also to, uh, to, to explore this idea of what can we do to, to buy some time to limit the negative effect and so on. Can you say a little bit more about the, this concept of alkalinization as, as a solution? Yes, uh, in fact, uh... The, the field is extremely active. It's uh, just incredible, uh, both uh, from the scientific perspective, from the engineering perspective, funding coming from uh, uh, governments, you know, public money, and also from the private industry. I mean, this is, it is quite, uh, my head is spinning when I hear all those activities. So for example, uh, the national academies uh, in the US have produced two reports very interesting ones uh, on uh, uh, solutions to climate change. And of course, uh, the marine uh, measures are also uh, included in those uh, reports. Uh, there is the SROC report as also a section on uh, ocean-based uh, measures. Uh, in terms of uh, research projects, there is uh, one uh, EU project called OceanNet, uh, which is coordinated by DEF Keller uh, at Geomar. Uh, and, uh, the, and yesterday and the day before, I was uh, in the scientific advisory board of a new German uh, project uh, called um, CDR Mare. So that's carbon dioxide removal in the ocean. Uh, a big, very big project, uh, 26 million uh, euros. Um, 200 scientists involved and uh, looking at various aspects of uh, uh, carbon uh, dioxide removal, uh, including artificial boiling, uh, including uh, alkalinity enrichment, uh, CO2 storage uh, in the deep ocean, uh, and also uh, dissolution of olivine, for example, on beaches. So, uh, this is just a, a subset uh, coming to mind, uh, just to mention that uh, this is a very active uh, research uh, area. Uh, yeah. And also the assessments are, uh, are quite numerous. Uh, I think, uh, in, but at the same time, I, I am a little concerned uh, that uh, the emphasis is on uh, uh, engineering uh, solutions. Uh, not that engineering for me is a bad word, uh, but uh, I mean, um, to see that the ocean is, will be subject to uh, lots of uses, uh, the ocean, the blue uh, economy, uh, plus, you know, measures uh, to uh, fix the damage uh, that was uh, done in the past uh, by uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, I fear uh, that all this will uh, I'm not sure it will lead to a sustainable ocean in the future, but uh, we need to be very watchful and science has to speak very clearly about uh, the potential negative uh, effects of all those activities. Thank you, absolutely, Jean-Pierre. I could not agree more. And maybe Kirsten, you, you're quite active in the field of blue carbon too, I think among all your multiple responsibilities. So do you want to say a few words about that? Yeah, <clears throat> just a, a, a few general words from IUC. I think uh, with the multiple ocean stressor um, brief, of course, now we also have to define the next steps, what we are doing in this in this regard and uh, how to collaborate with other existing activities, more working on the ground, but really trying to get this information from the scientists as well to the um, national representatives, to the governments, uh, to take actions. One step will be hopefully as well the UNFCCC SIPSA dialogue where we push for multiple ocean stresses as well to be part of it, as well as the Lisbon conference, I think, where <clears throat> ocean acidification, deoxygenation and ocean warming are addressed together in the informal uh, dialogue number three. Um, so where we are highly involved in actually preparing this concept note. Um, with blue carbon, I think blue carbon, uh, we have to be very clear about its limits, but also its potential. So at local levels with 
clear um, support to really reduce the impact of different ocean stresses uh, being also an area where we hopefully can uh, protect, increase the protection and to um, have those refuge for, for a healthy ocean uh, in certain areas. Um, there will be also another blue carbon program most probably endorsed now. So where you see is quite involved. And, and so let's see where, where we go from there. Um, I think it's a big potential for certain countries and needs to be um, shown how maybe also other uh, potential blue carbon ecosystems can be accounted for. Uh, so there's, I, as Jean-Pierre said, my, my head is spinning uh, too many things happening at the same time. It's very exciting and very exhausting uh, at the same time, but uh, I'm looking forward to also really continuing the discussion here with many of those who presented. Um, I know that Steve also has his hand up uh, before we close. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, uh, I would just I just want to really emphasise uh, what John Pierre was saying, and also Kirsten mentioned that that we mustn't allow the interest in in proposed solutions to distract us from the primary solution, which is to reduce emissions. Um, the the scope with which some of these solutions can make a contribution really need to be understood and the perhaps the impacts the the unintended consequences associated with some of these really need to exp be explored further but it's so important that the the they are studied in a in a perspective of exactly how much contribution they can actually make and 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 distracting from emissions reductions is certainly an unintended consequence from this interest in these areas that we want to avoid um, in terms of going forward into the future and thinking about opportunities i am aware that the un ocean decade will be launching another call for projects and initiatives very soon uh, i think around with a deadline of around april we would be very, very interested in talking to people who are looking to submit ideas and proposals into the ocean decade to see how well they can fit in with existing decade programs. So please have conversations with us at an early stage if that's something you wish to do. Thank you. That was all I wanted to say, Kirsten. Yeah, thank you. So just to... So the call will be out 15th of April, but the deadline won't be 15th of April. It's just a couple of months, I guess, afterwards. But thank you for, for highlighting that. I think it's important um, to broadening the, the engagement in this effort. And I think um, we probably close now uh, and um, go to the last uh, point in our agenda, the conclusions and next steps. and. I'll leave the first word to Sam, and then we. Thank you, Kirsten. So it was great to to, to see so many of you, and and, and I was also, also would like to thank all the the, the panel participants and, and speakers. I mean, it it was really only two hours, so it was really uh, superficial in many ways, but that gives you an idea of the challenge and and also the resources available. So we really hope that this is just the beginning, that you will join Goan, that will you will contact us, and and that we will. Uh, help each other in many ways the task is enormous so uh, and we need to act fast so this this is with some of you a first contact and i'm really pleased that it happened and uh, please please contact us and thanks uh, kirsten for the for co-chairing and all the organization and pushing us uh, in the right direction all the time and it worked really well i thought so thanks thank you very much uh, seems i'm becoming famous for being a bit pushy but uh, I thank you all for being here with us as well and also from the IOC uh, point of view and uh, not only from, from the ocean science section, also from the uh, decade coordination, I think wearing different hats always at the same time. But uh, it's, I think really also speaking um, for us, um, if you want to contribute, if you have ideas to, uh, for the different outcomes as well, um, join us in our efforts, um, join the efforts on multiple ocean stresses. I think uh, <clears throat> it's important to look at single stresses, but in a multi-stressor world. 
Um, and so um, there are so many great brains out there and um, I think it's a um, great ending for uh, International Women's uh, Day week, whatever we want to call it, um, with great women as well here on the panel. And um, I thank you all and uh, we'll actually move now to the next uh, satellite event focusing on deoxygenation um, where we will hear a little bit more about deoxygenation and the decay. So thank you all. Um, <clears throat> and thank you to the coaches. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to Sam. And um, hope to see you in person, maybe in Lima or somewhere else in Lisbon, even before. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.